well, that's that's all we do here. Playing D and D comes in many forms. Sometimes it's just talking about playing D and D. Making you mad. Sorry, I'm I'm putting together my post. Are you? Are you putting it together? Yeah, so I just joined. You wanna I, you wanna see how dorky I am? Bring it. I just joined a new uh, uh, social media, but it's Korean. That's so dope. So I'm going super deep into this Korean thing. Wow. Um, what am I? Uh, yeah. That's so cool. All right. It's so. So cake house, house story and cake house talk. I think I saw that, and I respect the geek. Um, <laughs> that's that's really cool. So what I, what what I was jumping into is oh yeah, we have a stream. I don't know when it's going to happen. It's going to be in the next um, month or two. Hey Phantom, good to see you, Robert. Um, I want to talk about the old school roots of D and D and the huge vilification of it by the community of faith, uh, which I experienced uh, as a young man. In fact, I made some decisions which I deeply regret. Uh, some of my uh, amazing old school D&D stuff gone now uh, as a result of this vilification of it, demonization. Uh, there was a kid that went into a cavern in the late 70s or early 80s and died and you had chick trap, but, but I'm also a strong Christian. So, you know, I'm looking at doing something in the next several weeks. I talked to Josh about this already. He knows uh, that is sort of a faith and fantasy and understanding how, you know, you can not only relish what, what we do here, but use it as a platform uh, to promote goodwill and, um, you know, just a, a lot of, I think a lot of good comes from this, which was not how it was originally seen. Uh, and I think I want to get like two or three people on with me that really feel it. And I don't know when I'm going to do it, but it'll be soon. Well, and that's, you know, that's something that extends to a, but so, so, so when I was in high school back in the nineties, um, our thing was a combination of theater and magic, the gathering, um, real big magic, the gathering dork. And, um, S similar sort of feeling with that um you know this was a little later luckily we had you know as a high schooler we had heard about the stuff about D, &D in the 80s and whatnot and so we were cognizant of that uh, but no i yeah you're completely right i've done research because i did um we were supposed to do a show called she kills monsters which actually is uh, a show about dungeons and dragons and so i've done a lot of research on the historical context in journals and magazines and things and you're completely right. It was it was not only vilified. It was, um, you know, the the stuff that was said about it was downright untruthful. It was demonization. It really yeah. was. Yes. And um, so I want to do a stream on that. And I know Josh is already in. And I want just one or two more. I'd love, it particularly for people that are strong in faith, whatever faith that is. Like I'm not, I'm not trying. I'm personally, I'm a Christian. Um, you know, and Josh is as well. I know we have many others. And I don't, I don't really push that on the stream. It does sort of influence the fact that I try to keep it, which I think works really well. Like I, I don't think we're missing anything by not being rated X as a, as a channel. I think it's it's fun, and we we kind of cross the lines a couple of times. <laughs> Josh, they can't see you, but that's funny. Uh, you know, we cross the line sometimes or get close. But I like being a place where fantasy role playing and Dungeons and Dragons is really. Um, uh, is celebrated, but isn't at odds with whatever your particular worldview is. I don't honestly care. Like, if you want to sit down with me personally, and if you think that um, if you're a Satanist, as an example, um, I would I would like to personally sit down and talk with you. But as far as being part of this community, it's not a problem for me. I, I, I just I want people to enjoy being part of what we're doing, and I don't think faith and fantasy should be at odds. All right, so. Let's move on. Uh, my Twitch client is lying. Yeah, I know. It always does that. It's still showing zero. There it is now, six. Hey, Electrified Pan. I really want to ask you about your username. I saw a picture, and I'm thinking, like, you actually use electric pans. Um, but whatever it is, we're going to kick off, and we are going live. Welcome to Lore Masters Arcanum. I am joined, as always by the wonderful, amazing, and talented Evelyn, uh, who plays Marathaliel, Irda, and Mary Millie, 
in my campaigns and does all kinds of cool stuff inside our Discord. Uh, she has brought a new bot in, which is doing fun stuff, even though I'm still kind of ticked off. It killed my level. And now I've got people like Johnny D. Fox that are crushing me on my level uh, where I was higher before. Uh, but she is still awesome. And welcome, Irda. Now, we have two guests with us tonight. Uh, we have the player of Shorewind, Terry, and then we also have the player of Brim. Uh, Josh is, uh, you know him as NPC Voices, and he also the maker of our Monster Monday. And I'm gonna let them introduce themselves. In fact, I want all of you, Irda, uh, I know that you have done this, Evelyn, many times, but I want you to do it again. Uh, <laughs> so I want you to walk through your socials, you know, theater where they can find you. I want to, I want you, Terry, to talk about your World of Warcraft um, uh, in your Discord, and we can pop all that in and all the stuff you're doing. And then uh, Josh, you, as a voice actor and someone that is really looking at moving into other types of acting and all the stuff that you're doing, I want you guys to have a chance to talk about that. So I'm going to let you think about it, and we're going to go to our sponsors tonight. And the main sponsor we're going to talk about is not really a sponsor at all. It is a partner, it is a friend. Jay Scott, Lord Gasumba, hosting Underdark Uprising, the mega stream, coming up here on February 19th and 20th. It is all in support of St. Jude's. And uh, Jay, as you know, is a huge friend of the channel. Uh, we're closely partnered together. Everything that is gained over that 24-hour mega stream will go to St. Jude's Children's Hospital. And uh, we really want you to be a part, and I'll give you the actual schedules for that. So on the first day, Friday, you have uh, Wiley, uh, Scott kicking off at 8 a.m. all times Eastern. And then you got Praetors, Troll Lord. Troll Lord Games has really jumped into this old school Greyhawk community and all the old school gaming stuff. We are so thankful to Chuck and the whole Troll Lords community. And they will be running a stream. Uh, the DM will be Steven Chenault at 4 p.m. Eastern. And then Blue Box will close out the evening. And it should be a great stream. All of our players are already set. We did giveaways. Man, it's a great cast. And I have so many horrible, I mean, wonderful things to do uh, for those players on that night. And you will not want to miss that session. Then the next night we have Starting at 4 a.m., Tim, uh, on Lord Gazumba's channel, uh, running a session, and all the way through, like you get Carlos with Castle Entertainment, Tim, you know, you, you got uh, Wicked Studios with Will, Nightheart Gaming, who we've rated many times. They actually are the one group I'm most envious of their audio video stuff, because they're so good uh, with their AV, and we love Nightheart, and then Jay uh, finishes it off. Uh, on that night. So you're not going to want to miss this. It's going to be a great event, February 19th and 20th. And you'll see this all on our channel. You'll see it on Jay's channel. All the, So this is not on uh, tabletop events. Uh, we're not using these sort of typical streaming mechanisms for this. Uh, it's going to be on each of our channels. And you are not going to want to miss a moment of this. All right. Start with you, Millie, then let's go to Shorwin, and then let's go to Brim. Give us your socials and tell us where people can find you. Yeah, um, hello everyone. Um, you will most likely find me here on Blue Box. I'm here every, all the time. Um, but uh, I'm Evelyn, and um, I you can find me on Instagram and Twitter at Theater Evie. Um, I also do a podcast twice a week with that guy right there. Uh, on at the Magic ED, we talk about w World of Warcraft on uh, Monday nights at uh, let's see, that's been 9 p.m. Central Standard Time. Um, and then uh, we uh, have a little uh, DD podcast as well that we have uh, done a couple of episodes for on Thursday night at the same time, so it's pretty great. Well done. All right, let's go to you, Terry. I'm Terry. Uh, Terry Jakimiak, uh, the second, uh, also known as Machik in just about every other gaming situation that I play. Um, I, uh, you know, uh, Twitter is Machik ED. Instagram is Machik ED. Which has nothing to do with <laughs> other things that are <laughs> <Machik> related. <laughs> 
so, uh, so as as Evelyn was saying, we do uh, um, a uh, Warcraft uh, podcast Mondays, two tab- two torn tables, and a microphone, and then on Thursdays, roll for perception. Perception. That's R O L E because we're witty like that. And um, of course, you know, I have an eyebrow. No, it's true. No, you no, you have two <laughs> monstrous <laughs> caterpillars. I've given one to Winston, unfortunately. <laughs> you have. You trained him. All right. Uh, go ahead, Josh. Uh, well, hello. I'm Joshua Blake of NPC Voices. You can find me on Twitter or Instagram with random weird videos teaching different weirdness on voice acting or just watch me do once again weird stuff with weird voices um and actually something pretty big coming up as of friday so i would definitely recommend going to check it out uh, or you can find me with these three other goons on tuesday nights <laughs> of great hot awakening um where i'm brim the goliath oh no not goliath no, half ogre. Ooh, 5e 5e brain um of the half ogre fighter duck in a cave uh, uh, I'm sorry, he, uh, he said 5e, so he is now deleted for a bit. Um, no, I'm just teasing. Oh, no. <laughs> he deleted your face. Oh, man. Where, where, where'd he go? I don't see him anymore. Uh, <laughs> no, I actually like 5e. Uh, and I think, no, it's so much fun, uh, all that you're doing, Josh. And, you know, you as a, as a member of the community, you are really engaged. Uh, you're doing a lot of stuff with role play. Uh, you've got, uh, of course, you're involved with Chris Solo and all the stuff that he's doing with Fable 42. So just talk to us about a little bit more of what you're doing. And I'll figure out how to get you back on the screen here now that I've, I've deleted you. Uh, <laughs> I, was like, uh, I know, I know. Back yet. I was like, Man, Zoom has betrayed uh, me. I'm it, actually not doing too, too much with Fable 42 right now, but I am starting to do a lot more with the initiative order. They actually, I am ramping up right now, and I am fearful to say it because of all the people listening. Say it, say it, say it. Reveal it first here. Campaign. <gasps> wait, 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 what? You're doing your first campaign? My first ever stream campaign. I have never done this, and I swore that I would never stream a campaign because I would want it all in person. But what helped me get to this point of being willing to stream a campaign is actually John because I thought that stream campaigns, especially remote ones, could never succeed. And John and my fellow cast members of Greyhawk Awakening proved me wrong. And through like the interaction that I had with him as a DM, as well as these other goons, um, it helped me realize that it actually is possible and the interaction to be made with uh, members of the community, as well as in D&D in the campaign can work. Wow, okay, so I've got so many emotions with that. One, just gratitude and humility, and Josh, you and I connected. We're gonna be, con- we're gonna be connecting a lot more. I think we're kindred spirits, you and I, and we're gonna be talking about all kinds of things, RL and fantasy world. Uh, but uh, I'm also, so first of all, there are not three goons on with you. There are two go- goons and a lady, so please get that right. Secondly, uh, when you say you didn't think it could be done, until you watch me, what I think I hear you saying is, man, uh, if he can do it, I can do it too. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, so, so thank you, everybody. Thank you, uh, Robert, Phantom. Uh, and then I, oh, there was another one earlier I missed. Uh, Iculus, thank you for the gift sub to Anna B. Meyer. Great to have Anna B. Meyer with us. And Mike, Retro Gamer, good to see you as well. Tonight, let's jump into it because we don't have a lot of time. We're talking about really investing yourself in your character. And I want to show you first, to get us off on the right step, seeing what it looks like to a community when you invest yourself in a character, you create this this thing that I didn't even know was a thing called fan art. And we have had some of the most amazing fan art. So you remember seeing this, of course, Pat Draws, uh, the winner of the dinosaur uh, vampire, so that's taunting me, taunting Jay, and then wearing a brazier because I briefly mispronounced brazier, which I know I, I caught myself, I said it before, but I'd screwed it up and boom. So I kicked off a contest and Pat Draws did this. Also, uh, Pat Draws did this. 
uh, gimbal, losing a snow fight. This all comes from role play. This comes from investing yourself in your character and the, w your audience winds up loving it. And Gimbal had a snow fight session. Uh, it was really spontaneous two weeks ago and it produced this. Um, I'm gonna save the third one, but the fourth one, this was from last night on the uh, Greyhawk Awakening campaign uh, <laughs> where you have this new creature, not a gelatinous cube, a, a modification or a variation, a baleful cube, uh, which the party encountered, and, uh, <laughs> and Kimball hates jello shots. The Greyhawk frat party with the jello cube. All right, so I've got Dragon Magazine articles, which I always have for this uh, you know, LMA, and I'm going to show you some funny, funny things tonight. You guys are not going to want to miss this. The, uh, if you're not availing yourself of all those great Dragon Magazine articles, I know I say this every week, you are missing out. I love all the new content. I love everything that Troll Lord Games is putting out. Everything we have coming from groups like Mantic Games. All of the 5e stuff. It's oh, There's so much wonderful content. It is... Uh, the renaissance, I wouldn't even call it the renaissance, it, it's, it's a time never seen before in fantasy gaming and there is so much great content. People like me, when I grew up, you know, the, the geeks were vilified and you, you, you were, you were kind of castigated and you couldn't be in the cool social clubs if they knew. So, you know, if you were, then you had to kind of hide it. Now today it's mainstream and as a result, we're all benefiting because you got so many new minis and terrain and books and artwork. It's just everywhere, which is so much fun. All right, so with all that said, how do you make your PC come to life? And I'll pull up a Dragon Mag here, but I'm gonna start with you, Evelyn, as our resident uh, partner in Blue Box, and you are, you are bringing multiple PCs to life. Uh, tell me what, what, to you, makes a PC feel real. Um, well, I mean, the first thing that I have to do to help me build what I consider a realistic and, and uh, a character that I feel is three-dimensional and immersive is to, to have a really well-written uh, backstory for that character. You know, to for a character to feel real, they need to have a life of their own that's happened well before the, the moment that they you know, set foot on the road with this party of adventurers that they're, you know, in. They have hopes, they have dreams, they have aspirations, they have fears, they have, you know, faults. And without, you know, those things, they aren't, uh, you know, they aren't a living, breathing thing. Um, they, you know, so all of those things, anything that a, a real person has is what helps, you know, establish, you know, a very realistic character, in my opinion. All right, so great. And so we've talked about uh, backgrounds uh, before on LMA, uh, but then we got a lot of new viewers as well. And actually, I, I referenced this magazine, Dragon 188, in that, uh, which actually has a role versus role, which was part of the thing that Terry said earlier today. Uh, so Terry, I'm sorry you did not create that. Uh, it has been around for a long, long time, but still, <laughs> you're still dead on. And so we're going to talk about this magazine. Now, I just saw Anna pop in the chat. Uh, that and I'm sorry, I, I geek out when I see people like Anna. Uh, I used to do the same thing with Leonard Lakofka. These are legends of the game that have contributed so much. And she said she's on her, she's on number 90 of Dragon Mag with rereading every single article. And by the way, I'm going to give you some examples tonight of why that is fun to do. Um, don't just look at the articles and think, oh, I don't care about um, you know barbarians or. Um, you know, arcane, you know, 12th level, but whatever. I, I just, there is so much fun in these dragon magazines and you'll see it when I show you a couple things in a moment. But Evelyn, I think backstory is a great place to start because as we said before, it gives the DM and the player a sense of the reality of the PC. Uh, and then as a, as, a, as a player, now that's your sort of, uh, your compass, uh, how your, your PC should react as a DM, it is a treasure trove of ways to torture your player. No, it's a treasure trove of ways to make your players feel like they're living in a breathing world that reacts to what they are and who they are. All right, uh, Terry, give me something that you think that brings a PC to life besides amazing eyebrows. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's tough then. Uh, no, but seriously, and, and we've got to understand that, that 
my background's in theater, and so I bring what I do in theater into my games. Um, uh, you know, D and D is about creating characters. Uh, when you're on stage, it's about creating characters. And one of the things that that um, I teach in my classes is that uh, characters have needs, wants, and desires. Um, they have something that they're striving for, they're trying to achieve, and those things can help um, uh, imbue your character with uh, personality, with attitude, with uh, ways of living their life, but you've got to find out what those needs, wants, or, and desires are. And, and just like Evelyn said, if, if, if you have a good background, you should have a pretty good understanding about what it is your character's trying to do. You know, every uh, if you look at any novel or play or movie or f or television show, there are uh, these arcs, these objectives, um, what we call super objectives uh, in the theater that um, people are trying to achieve, and even villains. And and this is one of those things that I think is so important. We have to understand that villains are right. Villains are not doing anything wrong in their eyes. And so when we have our characters. Our needs and wants, desires are in kind of a counteraction to those villains, and we are trying to achieve something. And so, you know, as I as I build my characters, that's one of the things that I'm trying to figure out is what is it my character wants? What are they trying to achieve? No, I love that, and I want you to talk. There's a reason I wanted you and Evelyn on here. Well, Evelyn's on here every week, but I really tonight wanted you, her on here because you guys are both a theater background. And we're going to talk about acting tonight because I know that's something not every D and D player is comfortable with. Uh, we we have even some great friends that participate in other streams where it's it's not that they're not invested in the character. Uh, they they will talk as the character. They will be they might even think about the character's motivations or as you said needs, wants, and desires. But they're not imbuing it with voice acting or other things. And you don't have to do that to play D and D. Now to me. I love it, and that's how I want to play my D&D, &D, but you don't have to do that to play D&D. &D. Now, one other thing I want to ask you about, Terry, you said need, wants, and desires. One of the things that I have on my list, and it's actually on an article that we'll hopefully get to here tonight, is also uh, weaknesses, but I think that could fall into needs, right? So may maybe their weaknesses or you know their idiosyncrasies, thank you for the sub, Rory, uh, their idiosyncrasies, would you kind of, when you're doing acting, I don't want to put sort of my role play hat on, I want you right. to tell me, how do you look at that when you're doing sort of the theater stuff, because you need this vulnerability and to make it real and connectable to the audience? So, so we use a, a slightly different term, they're flaws. Flaws. We have flaws, which means, you know, just like us in real life, we have our flaws, the things that are not great, the things that are not perfect, the things that, um, and, and, and it can be any number of things. You know, when we, when we look at, at somebody, you know, what is their flaw? Is it, you know, that they desire more money than they have? Do they desire fame stronger than they care about things like family or love? You know, what is it, you know, do they have uh, an overabundance of pride that gets in the way. And, and, and I love how you, because weaknesses is a good way of putting it as well. These things get in the way of what they're trying to achieve with those needs, wants, and desires. Right. This is, our, the villain is not always another person. The villain is sometimes us. Yeah. No, no, exactly. And so, you know, Rory asked the question, is a weakness a need? Well, that depends. I mean, it's all, this is, you know, we're getting into sort of psychological constructs here, but if my, if my need is validation, and I need the validation so badly, I will compromise principle, or I will, you know, become obsequious in the presence, like, then that can become a weakness or a flaw, as he puts it. So that's why I really kind of couch it that way. I think it's an interesting topic and really makes your PC feel real. Uh, all right, and we will talk about DM tips here because I can't do that. I can't do an LMA without DM tips. But I really wanted this to be geared to more role playing and how a player can bring a character to life. And, and well done, Terry. All right, Brim, um, you, my friend, uh, talented, youngest of the group, uh, by a long shot. Hey, wait, so uh, can you put up a poll? No, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to insult you, Evelyn. But can you, can you, <laughs> Evelyn? Uh, can you put up a poll? I would like. Now, you don't participate in the poll if you already know the answer. I would okay. like you to put up three ages uh, for Brim. Okay. Is he twenty-four? 
Is he 28? We're going to do four choices. Okay. Uh, is he 29? Or is he younger than all? And while you put that up, uh, all right, Brim, I don't know if that embarrasses you. You should never be embarrassed about being younger. Uh, and so tell us about how you imbue your PCs with a sense of reality. Well, the reason I got so frustrated is because this whole time I've been like building my, my essay and I'm like, yes. So I'm gonna build it around flaws. And then I was like, well, poo. No, no, okay. no, 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 no. <laughs> we, we scratch the surface, man. Dive into flaws. Yes, so please. For me, I love flaws. That's almost one of the first things I build, or at least um, the way I sent you my backstory for Brim was that I chose one event that was the changing point of his life. And from there we went. Um, for me, flaws are ever growing, ever changing. And like everyday life, you could gain more flaws. Now, a flaw could be uh, a fear, a new fear that you have. And what you saw from like last night's session, Brim hates tight spaces. That is a flaw of his. He hates being confined and it really messes with him mentally and physically when he gets into- Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna inter interrupt you for just a second only because I wanna tie it back to what Terry said and then I want you to kick right back off where you were. This is why I distinguish between flaws and weaknesses. I don't think being afraid of tight spaces uh, spaces is a flaw that to me feels more like a weakness a flaw in in my mind and you guys push back on me or chat push back on me a flaw has more to do with your character than a phobia or you know so maybe something if, if, a, if a little child who is constrained to small spaces um, struggles with that as, as an adult I don't call that a flaw I call that a weakness but all right you resume valid I accept that. Um, so I don't, other, but I'll get back to that. Myself. Okay. <laughs> it's because in theater and in acting, flaws cover it wide. Uh, but where was I? Boop. ADHD. Come I'm on. sorry. I'm sorry. The cave and uh, yes. spaces. So the flaw or weakness, or we could go into the point of, uh, let's say, uh, a party, a group of players goes into a dungeon. And we have been burned so many times before. And instead of, you know, walking through this dungeon and, you know, going normal ways, we go very slowly. That might be a flaw of being over, um, over careful. That's not the word I was looking for. Overly but cautious. Overly cautious. Thank you. But yes, overly cautious with every step, every movement, and that's something you build with flaws and weaknesses are something that builds a character from there. It's You're not meant to be a stagnant hero. You're not, yes, I am old Bart the old, and I will <laughs> always be this way, and I will always rush into battle. No, it's like you could rush into battle one time and then practically lose your leg. You're not going to do that again because that's, you know, generalization. It's our brain saying, hey, we probably should not do that again. Okay, no, 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 no. So that's, that's, I, I want to comment on that, but do you have anything else you wanted to say on that topic? Because I don't want to cut you, because like, I thought that was, that was so great what you said, and it reminds me of a lot of what has happened inside the Greyhawk Awakening campaign. I'll, mm -hmm. I'll just bring up, well, I could actually every player, but the two that come to mind for me first are you, um, the Three Trees incident, and the way you slew him and crushed him and your violent side, uh, which is not the trope, uh, for a half ogre, which we'll, we'll talk about tropes if we have time tonight, um, it really rocked you and changed how you looked at the world. Gimbal, all that he has suffered, uh, I've been slicing pieces off that character through the whole campaign, and he, you know, he's and it's changed how he's reacting to the world. So it's not you set this this trope up. This is who my character is. No, that's a baseline, and then as you, you, you just like you want the DM to react. Right? You want the DM to adjust the world to your actions. You also, as a player, need to adjust your PC to what happens. Amen. All right. So um, we're going to save the weakness versus flaw uh, comment for just a moment, uh, Terry. Hopefully, we'll have time. I'm going to show you a Dragon Magazine I pulled up here. Uh, this is Dragon Mag. 
Uh, by the way, again, these are all on and an archive. Uh, Evelyn's probably already popped it up. This is 144. Yeah, yeah, I knew you had. You <laughs> always do. You're on top of it. Um, so this, first of all, I love the artwork on the front page. You know, Valhalla, uh, this large sort of operesque uh, lady on top of a donkey. And this is by Daniel D. Horn, and they call this their spring swimsuit issue. Um, but what I wanted to skip down to, and again, this is like, it's so much fun content when you read through these. But, uh, so I'll be honest, this was a mistake for me. I was, I, there, cause there was a role play hit on this article. And so I started going through it like I always do and highlighting things cause I was gonna get to the role play article. When I get there, it actually has nothing to do with what we're talking about tonight. So we're not gonna show that. I just wanna show you a couple of fun letters to the editor. <laughs> this is a total throwaway. One, uh, to Dragon under odds and ends. I'm a new subscriber. I love your magazine. This is my first letter, so I have high hopes you'll answer me. This isn't your everyday letter. It deals with sexuality among the different races in the AD&D game, and I hope you can answer the questions I was brave enough to ask. Remainder of, of letter deleted by the editor, um, next. <laughs> <laughs> or, or I love this one here to the right. I, I, I can't even read this. Dear Ed Kitter, I wrote you about three more ago with didn't answer but my cut walk. And <laughs> you can read this. It's fun. You're still not getting an answer. Uh, so it is, it, there's so much fun stuff. You got sage advice, um, uh, questions like this one. Uh, and there are many of these. Uh, when a character is raised or resurrected and loses a point of constitution, does he also lose the bonus hit points? So, for example, if a 13th level paladin with an 18 con is raised, does he lose 13 hit points? And the answer, they basically say yes. And I'm, I'm, I'm veering off the PC roleplay here for just a second uh, because I love this. This is how we do it here, but we modify it. You'll remember when Gimbal died and was raised, he had to make a check to prevent him from losing two hit points of constitution. I like very punitive death. I'm not permadeath. You know, I, I think permadeath is very permanent, uh, but I like, <laughs> I, like having, I like having death be fearsome. I've had level loss for characters that took heavy crits. I've had con losses. I've had major impact. You should not go you know, from life unto death and just bounce back and you know my term, like a CRPG, like, CRPG. like CRPG, like World of Warcraft, like you, you, you're, you're CRPG, that's not what I want my D&D &D to be. All right, that has nothing to do with the show tonight, but I love this old <laughs> Dragon Magazine, and so I thought I'd share it. Now, I will go to one that does have to do with tonight, and Anna has not reached this one yet. This is 188. Uh, uh, she'll get there, knowing her, probably in the next week and a half. Uh, but you've got the old sort of 2E source books. And here, let me grab this so I'm not doing such uh, run screw. So you go down, and we talked about this uh, in a previous LMA, but I wanted to highlight it for these pl uh, players, and I want them to really take the rest of the show here. So I'm going to be stepping back and letting them really drive the re remainder of the show. Uh, but I could not help but stop on this uh, a note about Fritz Lieber. Uh, Fritz Lieber, if you've not read his stuff, Fafford and the Gray Mouser, uh, he also created the Lankmar uh, book, uh, which is a huge part of D&D lore. And this was someone uh, who wrote into Dragon Magazine acknowledging his passing in 1992. Uh, long time rip Fritz Lieber, fantastic artist, very creative, funny, wonderful stuff that he did. If you've not read his stuff, Read Fafford and the Great Mouser. Look at the Lankmar module. It is so much fun. Yes, City of Lankmar is the module. Uh, Walden Books. Anybody remember that? <laughs> they, they have gone the way of the dodo. Um, and we're going to skip through the editorial stuff. And we're going to get right into this roll versus roll. And I mean, just look at this old Dragon Magazine artwork. It's so much fun. All right. So, as you said, Terry, that's roll, not roll. So, who wants to take this on first? How do you balance as a PC the desire to win, the desire to, you know, be the hero, to roll the nat 20, to succeed against the villain, to foil, especially if you if the DM has irritated you and you really want to like how do you how do you 
you know, counteract that with the desire to, uh, well, why'd you cover your face? I wasn't thinking about you. You just self-reported. Um, so how do you, how do you do that? And then balance it with the desire to truly play the character to not, it's not even just metagaming. Like, how do you keep that, that PC authentic? Any of you, you're, it's wide you guys open. Go first because I've got a um, a full lecture here. Uh, once you guys are done, uh, so, so you're saying you're going to drop the mic when they're done, Terry? No, it's not a drop of the mic. It's you're going to be surprised by what I say. Oh, okay, all right. So who wants to go before Terry surprises you? Um, I, I, okay, I'll go first. Um, like uh, balancing the desire to win versus like versus staying with with keeping honest to your character. Um, would be, I mean, it just, it, it, you have to think in, in that, those situations, especially combat situations, um, you know, what, what is your character's motivation for being in that situation? You know, are you a Millie who's just trying to loot some gold off of a body here? Just, she's a mercenary type that doesn't really care one way or the other. Are you a paladin who's fighting evil and, and taking them down? Are you, you know, and, and, you know, so the things that motivate you by, what who your character is and and you know sometimes the, the these encounters that possibly could become a combat situation doesn't necessarily have to become a combat situation either if diplomacy is employed if it makes sense for your character to employ diplomacy if your character is really good at charming people for example and can can utilize their skills with uh you know uh, their charisma um, and are able to kind of smooth over a situation to get through it. And it, it also is a, a, a the factor of taking into account what the whole the party as a whole's motivation is as well. Um, because you know, if you're going to be in a an adventuring party, you have to find at least some common ground to be able to achieve whatever you're trying to achieve together you know you can't have chaotic evil people running around with a paladin it doesn't make sense they are their goals conflict um so that that would be you know in general you know ways to find that balance and to achieve what you're doing without necessarily having the mindset that i must win D D. right no, well, well said, bravo, and uh, that kind of goes to the quote I have highlighted here. Uh, he's, he's so the art, the author of the article, uh, which I mean I should have mentioned him earlier. I know I've done this before, but it's George T. Young, uh, artwork by Listen Lake, and there's some cool artwork. But he asked a player, "Why do you think they call it role playing?" And he said, "Because you roll dice." Uh, you know, it's a, that, that misconception, and I think as you have more and more people coming in that are new to the game, it's important for us as the um, old heads, even you, Josh, and the poll answer, what was the answer? I think everybody was like 11 to, what was the final score? The final score was like 11 to 2 of everything else, and the 11 was uh, less than, every, younger than everything else. So Josh, uh, how old are you? I am 43. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't know. He takes that good care of himself. <laughs> no, Josh is actually 16. Uh, he's not out of high school yet, and he's a he's a junior at a local school. Uh, he <laughs> plays croquet, and he covers his face with oil of Olay every single day. <laughs> I've, I've got to get to lacrosse practice soon. <laughs> Love it when that voice cracks. <laughs> 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 All right, I just completely lost my Okay, so yes, now Millie, I want to compliment you, Evelyn, because I think you have exemplified this, uh, what you were just referring to, with Irda more than any of your other PCs. Because, you know, you have Marathaliel, who is definitely, so she's the uh, Noldor, uh, she is wise, she is knowledgeable, she is powerful, uh, she's all, and then you have Millie, who is kind of, you know, very uh, quixotic and off the rails. But then Irda, who is an Azamar and is beautiful, which you would normally think would, would, would translate to this very knowledgeable sort of uh, arcane and magical character, but she was a farmhand. She was raised, you know, in a very rural area. And you've even seen the PCs sometimes, the other PCs, try to push you into this place of, well, you should know this because probably A, you're Evelyn, and then B, <laughs> you're playing an Azamar. Uh, but you have steadfastly resisted that and stayed with your character. 
Yeah, I mean, and I think that just going to that would be the best example of that was when she was put into the position of lady of the fortress, or, yeah, of uh, Fort Von Frost, and she was like, I don't know much about this, but I'll do my best, guys. <laughs> so... No, and, and, and in all candor, that was process of elimination. Right? I mean, it's like, well, who else are you going to give it to? <laughs> yeah. Was it going to go to Cade? Uh, no, I don't think so. Uh, Eamon, uh, you know, this uh, strange band. Like, they, yeah, it, was, it was definitely uh, you. Now, maybe Alcott in the future could get there, but no one knew who he was. All right, uh, Brim, uh, your thoughts on the same topic before we let Terry shut it down. Just, just so I don't go on a tangent, could you repeat the question for me one more time? <laughs> I'd like to phone a friend. I'd, I want to make sure that I like. So, I so like balance. So ba the question is like, how do you, as a, as a, as a player, balance the desire for your PC to win? You know, uh, brim to do this magnificent deed or crush this enemy. Uh, which, of course, when you're in combat, you want to roll well. But, but how do you balance that with the desire to stay in character for him? Well, it, it goes between three things. One, cheating. Two, not being able to do as much um, because Millie will always kill the creature first. <laughs> and then three is my actual, my actual answer. Uh, <laughs> you, you, for me, it's staying within the four corners of going back to it, your backstory. You have written all this stuff to make this character. Now, don't let your id get in front of your character. Don't let the me, me, me that's wanting to get ahead because D&D is not about me. It's not about me getting ahead like all of the cast. All of the cast can tell you how often I will text them after a game and be like, hey, do you think I talked too much that session? Like, I really don't want to be doing that because th that's not really the point of this. And they're just like, shut up. Like, <laughs> we love um, you. You're a great stuff. <laughs> no, no, no. I, lo I love that because, you know, so you are actually 22. Is that right? Right. Yeah. Uh, I am 49. I still ask the same kinds of questions. I believe being an eternal learner, anytime you think you've arrived and you're not willing to take coaching or feedback from others, you are dying. Uh, so I've even polled the players at times and I've said, hey, do you think I did too much here? How do you think this went? Never, never lose that, Josh. All right, Terry, give us the authoritative word. So, uh, so here's the thing, and, and me and Evelyn have had many a discussions about this. Um, I want to lose everything. I want to lose every time. I come with a very different mindset. For me, the story is what is important. I'm a storyteller. I've been a storyteller for so many years. And I, I'll be honest, John. I, yeah, okay, so you're gonna get some info that, that I think only Evelyn has heard. I was angry at you when Ashrin used this, a magnificent needle out of nowhere, because I felt it didn't fit the story. I'm not saying what you did was wrong. These are personal feelings. Yeah. And for me, I don't mind my character dying. I will, I still invest extremely, uh, uh, to the extreme in them. I know my characters, I know their wants, I know what they're trying to do, I know their feelings. But the story, not just for me, but for the company as a whole, whether we're doing it here or I'm doing it with my, you know, my group that here that I do in town where it's just us. The story to me means way more every time than what my character character can do. If my character is, is, is in a position where they should try to win, fantastic. But there have been times I have let a character pass where I've been given the option to bring him back. And I said, no, it, it, it destroys the story and it's just bringing a character back. It doesn't make sense. I don't want to do that. Yes. And so, you know, for me, I, will, <laughs> I, I don't want to win because those losses gives me something else to feed off. No, I love I love that response, and that is probably one of the most mature role play responses I could have possibly heard. And I don't mind that you were angry with me. I like, in fact, the more I make my players angry with me, <laughs> as long as it's not because I'm being petty, yeah. um, I'm fine. Now, actually, that was not scripted. Uh, I had so I had the, uh, the the version one 
of Ashrin from Jay. But I also worked to build out her character. Uh, I wanted her to have some extra abilities. Uh, she's kind of been uh, relegated at times. This was an item that she had, and she has a genuine affection for Shorwin. So to me, the story, the story becomes her extending the very last thing of power that she has to touch the one that has, it's unrequited, and, and I, you know, I think everybody knows that it's unrequited, but she feels that. For now. Yeah, for, <laughs> so she feels that, and she extends herself even uh, to the possible loss of her own life, and that to me was the story, but I love that it pissed you off. That was really, I, that's a great, great way to look at it. Uh, so. And, and, and I'll be honest, it took me another week or two to understand that, Hence, that changed my character. Right. And hence, my character has grown in a different way than I would have seen him growing initially. Uh, <laughs> exactly. Cold Steel Penguin said he thought the DM's job was to put PCs to death. All right. So I, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share one more sort of DM example here. Um, and this actually came up with Gimbal. He, he texted me or he discorded me last night. Um, he was super excited and he had, a, he had like a real valid question about something that happened between him and the ghost. And um, I used as an example, and I think I talked to you guys about this after the stream closed. So how much of what a DM does is scripted uh, versus how much of it moves? And I think, actually, let me come down. Um, okay, yes, here it is. So. This highlighted piece right in the middle, let me zoom it in so it's even easier to see. Let me come back up here. Uh, all right, I'm going to have to do the... Where, oh, I guess that's as big as I can go. All right, so plan scenarios are fine. DM should have plans. I'm all for the unscripted DM, too. Like, I've done a lot of ad hoc adventures. Uh, you can grab a bunch of people, sit down together with some PCs, and just tell stories. It's improv, right? Improv is a great form of art. Now, what I find as a DM, and maybe this is just sort of my preference as I've been doing this now for 40 years, is I love stories and arcs and interconnected arcs that are complex. They're not predictable. It's not one arc, but even within that, you've got to have improv. You have to let things unfold where you thought it could go A, B, or C, but then something happens. It could be the dice, or it could be the players, and you wind up with E and F that you never saw coming, and that to me is the essence of DMing. So he said here, plan scenarios are fine as long as they're not planning them. It doesn't make them feel restricted. The players need to feel they're interacting with the campaign world, not just following a set track carved in stone. There are so many examples of this in all of our campaigns. Last night, I thought squeaks would be snatched out in the first 10 minutes of the game. I had no idea we would be spending an hour and a half trying to pull this mouse out of the cube. Uh, but it was a combination of choices of the players and some really bad rolls by some of the players. And so it, it, it turns the session. Uh, and as a DM, you have to be able to work with that. Uh, now, I'll give you one example of a scripted piece last night. Um, I, I mentioned it to you after the stream. Who, who wants to talk about what it was? And I'm going to pull up a piece of fan art to illustrate. So, Brim, you went outside to check on Winston. What did you see? Oh, okay. Um, so I went outside to check up on Winston because I was like, okay, let's just regroup. I went out and I saw blood. And that's all I saw. I just saw an edge of blood in the snow. And I was like, oh, freak. John's been after Winston for weeks. <laughs> finally done diddly done it. And I'm like, gosh dang. And so I like, I yell, there's blood. Millie comes running with me. I go running outside. I turn the corner and what I see? Two wolves freaking bludgeoned to not to pulp to a jelly for Winston's sake. <laughs> No, no, exactly. And we see, uh, so this is, this is live, in session. Uh, the talent that we have with our viewers is incredible. Pat Draws did this one. Um, and Mark. what's that? That's Mark Fuse. That's oh, Mark that was Mark Fuse. Fuse. Yes, Pat Draws. Yes, thank you. So this is Mark Fuse and this incredible, uh, you know, pencil drawing of Winston uh, prancing up. He's got the burn armor on. He's got the blood streaming from his hooves. This was a DM on the fly just sort of 
screw with the players, right? Um, they had not been inside long enough for anything bad to happen to Winston. They, they'd only been in there for a minute or two. But since Brim went running out, uh, I'm, you know, just on the spur of the moment, I decide to screw with him. So I say, uh, you walk out, I think I said you see both blood, and I think I said something about fur or bodies in the snow. I can't remember exactly what I said because it was all spontaneous. Um, and then I got this reaction from the players, the viewers, all the oh no's. Uh, Millie gave me the finger on stream. Well, not quite, but close. And so it was, uh, and, and th there was never any danger for Winston, but it is fun to sort of, but, but this is an example where to me as a DM, scripting something is okay. Right, because what you're scripting is just for the fun of everyone. I have not hurt anyone. I've not changed the narrative of the story. I've just made things more fun, maybe a bit of suspense. Um, so I'll, I'll pause there, let you guys yeah, respond. When we go to break right after he says this, there's blood everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, anybody else have comments on that? Yeah, I mean, it would have been terrible for the DM had Winston died like that. <laughs> yeah, it, it, the viewers it, 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 would have come to your house. Uh, <laughs> it, it was everybody in there. They would have been like, oh, "I gotta go find out where John lives now." M Melly would, have, uh, Evelyn just would have posted it in the main <laughs> chat. It's like, "Here's You're his like, address. This is the address. <laughs> go now." Yes, yeah, I know, I, I know. I would have been on Google Maps. Uh, so this you know, is. Like, go, ahead. go ahead. No, no, no. You please go ahead. I was just gonna say what I like about that, and and and. You know, with the, with the DMs that I've I've worked with in the past, is I like when unexpected things happen because it can affect our choices, and when we have to deal with those choices, I think it makes the story more interesting. Well done, well done, exactly. Um, and yeah, Phantom, you're saying that now, but I saw you freaking out last night in the chat, Robert. You were worried about Winston. Uh, so the game is designed to be free form. It's co-managing your campaign with your players. Uh, and I believe in this. So I have my arcs and there might be some things that you can, so if for example, um, uh, let me not give something that's too close to home. Um, let's just say whatever your campaign world is, a deity is returning to earth. And or you know, to the and, and there are going to be all kinds of effects from this. Well, the players are not just from you know ancillary choices they make going to change that central narrative. So it's a combination of well, what things can the players realistically influence and what things can they not realistically influence, and you weave that into the campaign. Um, but what you must avoid at all costs is players feeling like they are, and I've used this term so many times. Say it, say it, Josh. Railroaded. Railroaded. Choo -choo. Exactly. So have your stories, have your ideas. That That is consistent with reality. There are plots and narratives uh, today. There are things going on in the world that have nothing to do with me. And they're moving forward without me. And if I move myself into the stream of what's happening with those, uh, then I, you know, I may just be run over or pulled down in that stream. I can't control everything. I can't control the Russian economy right now. Uh, I don't have the power to do that. Uh, but I could be affected by it if my PC, uh, playing you know James Bond 2021, is involved with that. Then that could pull him along. So it, there's this blend as a DM and as a player with recognizing what you can control and script to the the story and what is just sort of you're being carried along like flotsam in the stream. And let's be honest, it's way more enjoyable when in the middle of a session, John has something set up on the table. And we decide to go in a completely different direction. <laughs> that just happened and a lot. To reset it. I mean, we have Githa now and Ashton's hurt all because we decided we didn't want to go where John had set up the table for. <laughs> no, I love that. I do. Uh, no, actually, it really upsets me, Rory. It really does. Uh, Terry, I just think when you and, and Brim and, and Gimbal and Millie, uh, when you guys go those directions, I feel like a TPK the next session <laughs> is in order. No, I think it's a lot of fun. And that is part of especially a regular, or say a regular, a non-streaming DM. And we've talked about this. It's easier, right? You just pull stuff off the table. Hey, give me 15 minutes, guys. Uh, or I like DMs that just use uh, the, the um, not the boards, but the, the sort of terrain mats that you just draw ink on, right? You just draw ink on them or virtual tabletops or you're using whatever. Those are all fun ways to play the game, but you're not as restricted uh, as a DM. All right, so 
with our last good about 10, 15 minutes here. I want to really get deeper into the pathos of your PC. Um, so I don't want you to reveal too much, uh, especially with the Greyhawk campaign or the Rune Lords campaign where maybe it's not already uh, apparent in the stream, but as much as you can, talk about the evolution of your PC, how you react to events, uh, maybe from the DM and the NPCs or from combat, but from other players, and how you take what maybe started as a backstory and now it becomes something more than a backstory. It becomes an evolution of the character. Any of you start. Go ahead, Josh, you're up first. Cool. Um, I actually want to use probably one of my favorite instances of this between Brim, uh, my character, and Millie, Evelyn's character, when I can't remember if it was text role play or if it was in game because I just, I always get the two mixed up because these other players are so real when they're doing text role play that it feels like you're actually there. And in one point, Brim, my character, who in the beginning was deadly afraid of people because of what's happened in his past. He keeps his face hidden. He puts his upper lip over his tusks to make it look like he just has a big uh, overbite. And up until this point, he's just been like, no one will like me. I'm a monster in everyone else's eyes. And Millie when I'm talking with her, and I think it was outside the blacksmith, I was just saying something, I was like, well, it's, there's no point, because no one will see me as who I am. So I've just got to hide myself because they won't give me a chance. And Millie responded with, uh, Evelyn, do you remember what Millie said? Uh, it was something along the lines of, oh gosh, that, that was like early on in the campaign, because yeah, Uthar was. was still with us. Um, well, come on, you take was... notes on everything, Evelyn. Yeah. Like, <laughs> That was, that was like episode five, I think, something like that. Uh, but she said something, she was telling him about she had encountered some half ogres in her days on the seas uh, with her, her with her crew. And basically that, you know, everyone is good and bad. That And basically that, you know, there are good to bad and good and bad to everybody and that she's met both good and bad half ogres and you know to give other people the chance to get to know you basically something along that, that, that line before assuming that they won't you know and, appreciate you and that's what i loved about it was that she <laughs> millie who just the very spirit of millie is the spitfire she took my thought of why would uthar this other character buy me a great sword he owes me nothing i don't deserve this i shouldn't have this and she turned it around and was like, well, aren't you doing the same thing that you're assuming everyone else? Like, you're saying everyone else will hate you, and so you just come off the get-go with hating everyone else or keeping yourself away from everyone else. You're doing the same thing you think they are. And it just left Brim awestruck because he had no idea what to say. And from that moment on, he kept his hood down. And I don't know if Millie ever noticed that. But he stopped putting his hood up after that point because he wanted to try and give others a chance. I love that. I love that. All right, uh, Terry, your thoughts on this um, after you finish wiping your tears. Uh, Sorry, it was a evolution sad. of your evolution of your PC. So connection to your backstory, but divergence from it. Uh, I think you know again Shorwin is central to this but I, again I want you to say anything that's going to be revealing things that aren't clear on the right. campaign yet but you you've done this I'm sure in in all of your theater work you get the same idea you know the the the, the character starts here but it's the hero's journey sometimes or it's the villain's journey sometimes uh, so talk about that evolution and how how we can role play that well right and you know the, Shorwin the character started in a in a very specific place and uh, truthfully, I didn't know he was going to be where he is right now. And I think there's still more to more to come. And again, I'm, I'm trying not to reveal too much because there's a lot of stuff that I've been working on, the, the you know, background based on what's happened. And I think what we're seeing is, you know, it, it, he had a very simple beginning. Uh, and when I say simple, I mean, he had a hard life growing up. Um, we found out about his sister and his family a bit in a couple of episodes. Um, you know, if we remember early on, he, he, this was just another group that he was just going to, to journey on with for a little bit and then move on. Um, but, but, you know, if you look at last night, what he did, for example, for Gimbal and, and how he treated Gimbal was so very different 
than where he was when he began this journey um, in the Crown Hills, um, being yelled at for having a horse uh, in the Crown Hills. Um, and and so, because I remember I my first one was like, that. you got a horse? <laughs> You're going to humble him. him. That was Rayum. Yeah, Rayum oh. Ray, Ray was like, Ray You're going to humble that horse. <laughs> and so, you know, it's, it's, what I've what I've loved and 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 what luckily you've allowed me to do via the stories that we that that occur within this campaign is that the character can change and can use what is happening to grow and and I use this term a lot grow in theater because because when you when you talk about a character in a play a character is growing from the beginning of a play to the end and our characters grow and the instances the little bits, the little interactions between everyone, Lilith offering me the, the sweet rolls, um, you know, Brim's nods, um, Millie actually asking me questions, um, which he had not had, you know, he, 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 he deals with nobles in one. They don't, they don't necessarily ask you questions. Um, you know, people trying to, to get to know him more has affected him in both positive and negative ways. Not negative in the sense that, I mean, honestly, he lets his guard down a little more with this group than he probably should as, as a cavalier. And so it's, it's nice to be able to have those instances that help to build this character and flesh out their life. No, I, yes, I think well, well said and spoken like a true theater geek. Um, and I love that, 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 what you guys bring to the campaign, and uh, all three of you, you all have either present uh, work in theater, past work in theater, or aspirations to theater. Uh, so let's, l l before I want, I want Evelyn to answer this question, uh, but as she's answering, I want you to think about the topic of, do I have to act? Do I have to voice act to play D&D? Or what if I'm uncomfortable? Uh, you know, what if I just, I feel super awkward doing it? I want you to give tips uh, and tricks and you know, maybe even some absolvents, uh, whatever you guys want to talk about. Uh, Evelyn, so you quickly talk about, uh, by the way, there is no uh, Lord Gasumba uh, stream tonight. Jay is off tonight, he's got personal stuff. Uh, so we're not gonna know too much longer, but we're not gonna cut off quite as quick as we normally do. So we got a few more minutes left. Evelyn, talk about you know, this evolution of character from this evolution of character from backstory to what happens. All right. Well, uh, I mean, I have three characters. <laughs> um, so, but uh, I'll I'll just talk about Irda and Lily, really, because Martha always hasn't been as visible on the stream, so that's not really pr as present. But so with Irda, um, she started off um, very much. You know, she was raised on a farm. Her family is. You know, she had a lot of brothers and sisters. Um, right. And um, there was, you know, several of them were kidnapped by a strange figure that had their family had brought into their home uh, that they had entrusted um, uh, for the evening because he had asked for, you know, shelter for the for the night. Um, and, you know, so from the get go, her her life had been, you know, her first motivation was just train so that I can go out with my father and the rest of the, the men every year to try to find these missing children. And she'd been doing that her, her whole life um, to the point where finally she was able to go off on her own and do this. But she, you know, she, she was strong and she, you know, was able to do that because of her, her upbringing. <clears throat> so that's how she learned how to fight. That's how she, you know, that, and then that, the just you know rescuing her siblings and finding some news of them has been her entire motivation what well, was her entire motivation from the get-go um and then you know she she fell in with this very odd <laughs> odd group of people um and you know she she's a little mischievous uh and she was you know she she liked to play music and she liked to entertain people but she didn't she also didn't mind kind of uh picking on Solomon a little bit for him not being quite as strong as she is and, and you know, those sorts of things. Oh, you mean you know, humiliating so. him with the arm wrestling contest? Is <laughs> that what you're referring to? <laughs> um, uh, but, you know, just like, you know, that's and that's how she started off. And then Ixin began going down the path that Ixin began going down. And Irda had a sense of what she believed was right and wrong, but it had not really 
been so firmly finalized in her brain until she hit a breaking point with Ixen. And that's actually when she became a paladin. Ixen was the 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 final um you know catalyst for that moment. And she had prayed a couple of times early on in the campaign and it was very um it was very odd to her because she had never really prayed before, but she had encountered um, clerics of Saren Ray in her travels, um, and in one of the places that they had been, she had found a holy symbol of, of Saren Ray, and so she decided, you know, we're in a really bad place right now, why the heck not try to try to reach out and, and make a connection with someone who might be able to help me, and the rest of my friends and family. And so that's where, like, the, that was her first moment. We were sitting in uh, Thistletop. Uh, and that was her very first time praying and actually, you know, reaching out to Serenite. And that, that relationship grew uh, over time. And so that's what, you know, catalyzed into her becoming a paladin later on. Now with Millie, uh, she's still a little earlier on, but the biggest thing I think with her development from the very like, oh, I'm so cocky and fabulous, everyone loves me, uh, thing, she still has a little bit of that, but she's much more willing to be vulnerable with the party because they have shown that they are not going to be as closed off and judgmental as the people that in her 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 backstory had been which you know, i she had felt so right. much judgment for the first part of her life that actually being around people that like accepted her and and Lilith being the uh, the per first person to give her something with no strings attached at all, didn't expect anything in return. That was like the biggest turning point for Millie to actually like begin opening up to somebody. And Shorwin being willing to, you know, fight with her uh, or, you know, work on, on sparring with her and, and Brim just like being so kind and, and Gimbal just proving everything about magic users like flipping it entirely on his head because she had 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 some weird interactions um with magic in the past and so like all of that it just had changed her her expectations and has put her on a somewhat different path than i think she would have gone on had she not met these people no, I love that. Thank you so much for walking through that with us, Evelyn. And I think Millie in particular, her backstory is so interesting. And we probably still know, I'm thinking through this, I think we know the least about Millie uh, that we know of any of the other characters still in GHA. Um, and there is a lot of fun stuff that's still to come. Uh, it, but it will evolve based on how you play her character. But the past is the past, and the hauntings of the past um, you know, you can't leave that behind. Thank you for the sub. Oh, uh, DCG. And earlier today, I, I missed it a second ago. Ancient Gamer, DCG. Thank you so much for all the gift subs. And we're going a little bit longer tonight. We got some more fun to talk about. So uh, we had a question from Electrified Pan. Uh, I think it was him. And some of you already answered it. But yes, uh, someone also said, I think we're about to see. And you are about to see. So I know we got so many new viewers, and sometimes they probably, what is Blue Box? And there's only one person that's ever said this, and I do not want to meme. Uh, I do not want, uh, <laughs> thank you for joining Bearded Fortress. Um, it was Josh. The very, I think I was on a, a, one, of, one of the uh, you know, the shows with Chris, and he was like, what's Blue Box? Is that like blue balls? And I was like, you fiend, you have despoiled my brand. Um, no, so. Here it is. No, go ahead, Josh. You want to defend yourself? Oh, well, I'm not defending myself. I want to say the full joke so everyone gets it. Okay, go ahead. Blue Box. I was like, wait, is Blue Box like when you go really long without being able to play an RPG game? Yeah, okay. That was a better joke, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Well played. All right, so Blue Box, it back you, before you, so you had AD&D 1E, Advanced Dungeons and Dragons 1E. That was your player's handbook and your Monster Manual 1 and your DM's guide. Then you had this other system. Uh, so so uh, we'll put it in the chat. Uh, I want none of my old, old school folks. So all of you know who you are. Uh, if you're regular watchers of me and Jay, please don't answer. But if you're one of my newer viewers, do you know what Gary Gygax's gaming system was called before it was Dungeons & Dragons? So you're going early 70s now. 
early 70s, 72, 73, 74, before there was any D&D, &D, it was called something else. Nope, not Josh, not that, not Dungeons and Dragons. Chainmail, Bobcat, that's exactly right. So Chainmail, it was more of a tactical gaming system. Um, the role play really started to evolve through Chainmail, and then uh, you had the basic set of D&D. Uh, this was commonly called the red box, uh, even though it's still got, because it has the red dragon on it and lots of red highlights. The basic set of D&D, this is where things like an elf was a class, not just a race. Um, then you had the blue box, which was the expert edition. And this is the stuff I was raised on. So I played these. My first gaming set, I had the red box, the blue box, and I had the monster manual from AD&T, so I was, I was all mixed up together. Um, and then I later got a player's handbook, and I could never afford a DM's guide. So I never actually had the original 1E DM's guide until many years later when I had some cash. So the blue box is the expert edition uh, to which all my gaming uh, harkens uh, to. All right. <laughs> uh, the white box. So the white, was that chain mail? Yeah, it was yellow, I thought. I have, a chain, I have one of the old chain mails here. It was yellow, or maybe maybe it's just yellow with age. All right, so uh, <laughs> sorry, the chat's going really quick here. Um, yes, blue balls is now permitted as a term. Thank you, Evie. <laughs> All right, so uh, let's go to this idea because I want to I want to cover tropes. I got a quick article here. We got about ten minutes left. I want all three of you who are far more invested in theater than I am to talk about overcoming the fear of role play, of voice acting, of investing yourself with more than just, this is what I say, this is my role. And again, I am not judging anyone that doesn't wanna do this. If you have a gaming style where all you wanna do is just sort of like talk in a normal voice, that, that's fine, like that, you, you can play that way. But for those that want to play more the style that I love to play, if you, you know, you're here with Blue Box, you probably like some of what we do. Uh, and I'm gonna start with you, Terry, as the most senior of our theater people here. Um, talk about overcoming those fears and how you can really trigger yourself to connect, not just with the pathos, but with the emotion, the voice, the visuals. You know, it's the face, it's the hand motions, it's all of the, it's not just even voice. Talk about that. So, the first thing that I, I, I want to kind of jump back just ever so slightly, and the first thing that I want people to realize is that you are not your character. And this is a big thing we run into, um, whether I'm doing D&D &D or role play in World of Warcraft. Um, when people can separate themselves from their character, they can create a character that is both more interesting as well as not worry so much about being the character. Uh, sometimes people tend to uh, see themselves in their characters. And so trying to be themselves but be a character at the same time is very difficult. And so you have to separate yourself a little bit. Now, the other thing that I'm gonna say is that acting is not necessary. I go back old school Saturday Night Live and we talk about Chevy Chase when he played uh, President Ford. Chevy Chase never tried to replicate President Ford. He created a character based on President Ford. And so when you are quote unquote acting your character, you don't have to act, you have to bring your character to life. And how do you do that? You have to think like your character. You have to think about how your character would react, how your character moves. One of the things that we do in theater is called Le Bon Technique, which deals with um, the way your body moves can help infuse your uh, personality. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so these are, it, it is not about trying to act in a certain way. It's about finding who the character is and then how you talk is going to come out in that. When you know your character's cocky, you don't have to think about, okay, how do I talk cocky? cocky? You just have to know, I'm that damn good. And it's no longer acting, it's being the person. 
No, I, I, so I love that. And a couple things you said that I want to comment on, and we got a couple of questions in the chat. I'm coming to you next, uh, uh, Josh, because I want to transition from that to specifically voice acting, uh, which is, of course, what you do in NPC voices and how you do it. But, you know, part of it is the not giving a crap. I like uh, Terry's point about separating yourself from the character. I find this as a DM, and I'll give you an example. Uh, you know, uh, this is about as vulnerable as you'll see me get, except when I actually openly weep. Uh, beside that, uh, you know, when, I, when I'm uh, sort of kicking off a stream, sometimes I'll notice when I'm describing scenes and I'm me, uh, I might say, um, a lot, or I might say, uh, and I find, like, I, I'll go back and I'll watch it and it pisses me off. I'll look, I'm like, God, why would you? But then I'll watch, like, when I shift to an NPC, all that falls away. And there's no ums and there's no uhs and there's no stuttering because I'm not me anymore. I am, I, am, I, am, I am just playing that PC, that NPC, and I'm not thinking about me. I'm playing that character, but I'm not trying to make me that character or that character me. And I think that really frees you of a lot of it. Now, uh, it was also said, DM Dingbat said, having a table. Uh, and, and a DM that are accepting of this, right? So encouraging. You guys have seen me do this. I think I did it just last stream where I feel a little bit awkward for you, Shorwin, because you said I pray uh, for uh, squeaks. <laughs> I'm like, I put you on the, all right, let me hear your prayer. <laughs> I think you're probably like, I pray for this mouse. <laughs> it's like, oh, or if you go to our Rune Lords campaign, I had Chris Carson, and you know, I tell him, you got to call out for the hawk uh, that's coming back. And he's like, I call out for it. I'm like, no, let me hear it. And he's like, go! <laughs> I made him like three times. So a table and players that are accepting and pull that out of you can really help but i think you know even your like your posture your point of whatever you called it i what was the term like your posture affects how you uh, uh, uh yeah how you hold yourself the laba, you something laba, called laban movement laba, it so wasn't it was laban's like, i knew it wasn't laban's all right so <laughs> laban so like laban i found the same thing so you know if i am uh you know playing the aged you know, right, and I've got the guy I hunch over, and it just, uh, if I'm playing, I, I just, the, when I move my body, it just makes me feel more in that character. Um, I didn't have your incredible teaching, but intuitively, that just makes sense to yeah. me. I love that. All right, so talk to us about voice acting, Josh. Like, you especially, man, because you put yourself out there. Um, you know, you, you're not afraid to look silly. You're not afraid to do stuff that just is really off the wall. How do you get yourself in that mindset? Wait, I look silly or off the wall? Yeah, all the time. All the time. Every week. So, well, okay. Let me, let me start off with something I kind of saw in chat earlier. But I also want to bring up is that when I first started DMing, you're not using accents from this world to portray people within a fantasy world. If you're doing a British accent, it's not a British accent. You're doing the accent of Millie. If you're doing a slightly, slightly deeper with a bit of a slur on certain words, it's not because you're making fun of anyone with a slur. It's because I have tusks. And so I feel that my tusk will inhibit my tongue at times when I try and say certain words. When you take an accent that we see as Scottish, as a dwarf, that's not a Scottish accent. It's the accent of a dwarf of that region. So that's the first thing we're all cut into. If you can do accents and your players are like, oh, that's such a bad French accent. You're like, it's not a French accent. No, ex yes, exactly, exactly. And that's one of my biggest pet peeves is because even for me, I'm trying to say this humbly, for me, someone who does voice acting professionally, who does multiple different accents, I don't want to be told that, hey, that's a great French accent. I'm like, no, I want to be told that that is a very good elf from the northern region. Like, I want to know that you believe that is an elf. Okay, you know, honestly, I think that, I'm, I'm going to interrupt you for a second. I think that is the, that might be the best piece of advice uh, that I've heard tonight. Because all of us, we struggle with this. When we, now it's different when you're actually acting period pieces, right? So if you're doing what what uh, Terry and uh, uh, Evelyn have done, and you're supposed to play a certain character from a certain period in real life, then yes, you have to really mimic that accent. When you're playing D and D, this is all fantasy. So if if your French accent uh, sounds vaguely Russian, 
don't freak out. You're, you're not, your job is not to mimic modern day 20th century, 21st century France. Your job is to create an accent which is real to your character and then do the best you can to stay consistent with it. And if you mess up, so what? Um, you know, you'll, 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 you'll fade in and out and you'll struggle, but just keep doing it over time it gets easier. All right, Josh, continue please. Uh, and then the other thing I'd like to step from from there, going from player to DM, DMs. Think about when you're describing an area. Are you doing an accent when you're doing that? No. You're doing your voice. You're saying you walk into the clearing as you see the multiple grove of, or the multiple trees around the grove with the pool in the center. Does that require an accent to do? No. So none of DM being a DM requires an accent to do. If you want to do the amazing stuff that John does, which is changing his voice, or sh shifting your body if you're comfortable with that, if you're not comfortable with that, then describing stuff, describing a character, Words, that's all this game is, is words. So just use them. Just if you need to write down, if you need to script something and be like, okay, it's I feel more comfortable reading from something and then helping your players still get into it through improv little bits because, of course, at the end of the day, you want it to be real. You want it to flow the way the characters would like it to go and the way you would like it to go. It's meant to be fun for everyone. Yeah. So don't feel bogged down if you can't do a voice, if you don't feel comfortable moving your body or anything. As long as everyone's having fun at the table, that's the point of it at the end of the day. Exactly. Well, well said. And Electrified Pan said he wants some vodka. All right, let's go to uh, Evelyn. What would you like to say on this topic? Um, I mean, I think, I feel like Josh and, and Terry have already covered most of, of it. So. Okay. Well, would you like to say that in an accent, though? Um, <laughs> like, oh, well, how would you like me to say this? So, would, and, you, would, would you like me to go to Irda, or would you like uh, me to be Billy? Uh, <laughs> I love it. And so, I, I agree, like, 1,000% with Josh. That was one of my main points. Don't feel like you have to. Some of my favorite role-playing channels and streams, like, I've not seen a lot of people on Lord Gasumba's stream doing much in the way of voice acting, but their role-play is so much fun. The game is so much fun. You can play the game however you want. Now, I will tell you my personal experience is if you'll invest yourself in this and just work at it, it makes it more fun. Uh, I like it, but maybe that's just my weird pathology. But you know, working on doing a little voice acting and a little physical acting, it makes you feel more connected to your PC. And it, like the more you do it, the easier it gets. Uh, I know I'm not that good at it. I know I, I, my voices lapse in and out. Uh, my accents lapse in and out. I forget what they are from one, one stream to the next. But I still like, I think that's the, the main thing that I would say, just put yourself into it. I don't care. Like when I'm doing it, uh, if anybody wants to say something, fine, but I'm gonna throw myself into it. And even if it sucks, it's still fun for me. All right, last thing we're gonna close with here. Uh, this is an article. Um, and I don't, I don't know anything about green man gaming. I do this a lot. I'll do a Google search and I'll find articles I like from like, so if these people have all kinds of other horrible stuff on their site, I, I give them, uh, you know, no credit for that. I don't know what they have, but I like this article and it's quick. It's uh, seven tips for being a great role player and some of what we've already talked about. So, uh, one, creating your character and I, okay, Idris Elba, all right. Um, personality first. So. Think about your personality. Think about what they're like. Uh, I like this comment here. Too often class or race is picked and then personality comes after. It's tragically colored by the previous choices. If you like John Luther from the BBC series Luther, then take that personality as your own and then choose whether it's a bard or a sorcerer or a cleric or a fantasy. You don't have to like adhere to certain tropes. You match to what you want to play. Uh, ignore the tropes. I think the best example of this on the show tonight is Brim. You know, Brim is a half ogre. He's not a violent half-ogre. He doesn't rage. Uh, he's had a couple episodes, but largely he is, I, he's hallmarked by what? Like, what would you use as a word, Terry, for Brim? Well, I mean, other than dead sexy. <laughs> That's two words. Oh, uh, yeah. No, I mean, he, it, it, he is unconventional. And I think that's what's great about it. And I am... Uh, you know, I appreciate those non cliches. Exactly. Right? Ignore Going the tropes. Against the grain. Yes, exactly. Compassionate is the first word that comes to mind for me with Brim. Mm. Like what, what, what he shows as a half ogre, he has compassion. Right. He's empathetic. Um, he, you know, think of the whole the whole series with, with Gareth's daughter and the little bear and 
like the, the, we, there's so much tenderness in this half ogre. And oh, by the way, it connects with his backstory and what he the went he through. he killed three trees. Yeah, okay. That's, that's right. <laughs> oh, yeah, so, <laughs> so, so ignore the tropes. Now, I, you know, I personally still favor the, the genre feeling true to the genre. So, you know, I don't like taking this too far. Um, I'll let you draw your own sort of conclusions about what that means. But don't feel like because you're playing a dwarf, you have to be taciturn. Um, or you have to be a drunkard. Or because you're playing a havling, you have to like hiding in shadows. Maybe you're a belligerent, you know, ale drinking, you know, swilling havling. You can play whatever character style you want to, and ignoring tropes often makes for fun characters. Now, think of the party. Uh, balancing a party, a group of magic users with no armor could be terrible or fun. Party of fighters could be boring, but lead more focused campaign. Beyond classes, maybe you're all the same race or you grew up together. Uh, so don't you think outside the box of these traditional party bonds and essentially how you feel about every other member of the party is what matters. That's what you see on all these blue box campaigns. And I'm not taking credit for that. Whether it's the Rune Lords campaign, you've had the emotions for Solomon and sometimes the friction with Cade. And, you know, Cade is like a lot of eye rolls with Cade, like whatever the Cade's doing, right? But that's how they feel about that character. Uh, similarly, like you've heard a lot tonight about the Greyhawk Awakening campaign and how people are connecting with one another and how each of them are influencing one another. That makes it about party. I'm going to pause here. Uh, you guys want to say anything about sort of further about personality, ignoring tropes, or thinking of the party? What about Mike no, Tyson? I mean, I mean, I think that's exactly it is play your character to be true to your character. You know, it doesn't have to fit a mold. Yep. Anybody else? All right. Uh, during play, to act or not to act. We already talked about this, right? So you don't have to act. Um, if you do act, just remember it's acting. Don't, don't freak out. Don't fall out. Don't worry about it too much if you want to. Remember your flaws. So we're going to conclude with this uh, because this was a bit of a, a, a tension point, which I love. Um, we talked about weaknesses and flaws. Um, and I said I think there's a distinction between a weakness and a flaw. And maybe this is a social construct. And Terry uh, gave the uh, John, you're wrong, uh, which is now a fun uh, topic here on the stream <laughs> since I did that last week, <laughs> right? Uh, so tell me, tell me about why flaws and weaknesses are the same thing. So here's the thing: when we talk about a weakness, right, we look at a person and we think that that is not fixable. Because a weakness means that it, the feeling is, is that it's permanent. Where a flaw can be changed. We all have flaws that can be changed based on whatever it is that, that defines the flaw. And so that's why I, my feeling is that they're the same, just different terms. And, and for me, the, the term weakness just feels so passive. Where a flaw feels active. It's something that can constantly, we're always working on our flaws, right? Our weaknesses feels like it's permanent. There's nothing we can do about it. But a flaw, a flaw I can fix. Okay, so I'd like to know what people in the, in the uh, stream think about this, the chat. Uh, but M Millie and or Josh, any comments you want to make on that topic before we wrap up tonight? So yeah. if I, let, let's take it this way. If Ooh. I, if I am... Um, let me let me make this very sort of physical. Uh, if I am missing an arm, uh, maybe not by the way Cade did, uh, which which was by choice. Let's say I'm born that way. Is that a weakness or a flaw? That's neither. The, what Being is born it? Without an arm is neither. Then what is it? It it it, it, it is an impediment, right? Uh, so why we, why is it an impediment? Well, because I can't I can't hold a shield. I can't okay. wield a two-handed weapon, so why, right? So, so why is only having two arms instead of having three arms not an impediment? Because it's not natural state of the creature, right? We're what? in a We're fantasy world. No, no, We're I'm talking. About, all right, so, so uh, if I'm a human or an right. elf and I'm missing an arm, is it a weakness uh -huh. or a flaw, or is it something altogether different? It's and I, I, I'm different. not trying to make this political. I don't. I don't want to go to. I, it's yeah. something different. It's not a weakness or a flaw, because if you're born with that. You find ways to overcome it as you grow. So what if I'm born with a tendency to rage? Is that a weakness or a flaw? Or neither? If it can be overcome, it is a flaw. 
If it cannot be overcome, then it's neither. So what is a weakness if, then? See, I, I don't tend to use weakness because uh, again, weakness for me is something that it's, it's something we build out a flaw. Hmm. A flaw is, is, is somebody typed it in earlier. A flaw means that a person is not perfect. There it's, they call me Tim. I wanted to bring that up early. They call me Tim puts a flaw means a person is not perfect. Being ugly is a flaw, but having low HP is a weakness. So that's kind of what I was getting at. That's kind of what I was getting at. So whether it's being ugly, and I, 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 I probably shouldn't use that example because getting into physical yeah. disabilities and stuff, like that, that's not what I'm really trying to say. But if I have something I can't change, I can't control, that to me falls in the flaw category. If it's something I should be able to overcome or I could, it's my pride, it's my ego, it's my, then that to me falls into the weakness category. Or that's, but I mean, we're, we're parsing words here. It really doesn't right. matter. I just thought it'd yeah. be fun to kind of talk through it for a second. No, and you're right. I mean, it's, it's one of those things and different people are gonna look at it a different way, right? So, you know, how we might view it is gonna be different than maybe another group out there. And I love the fact that there is a lot of talk Lord Forth, Lord Forth said ice cream is a weakness. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> On this week's episode of Lore Masters, <laughs> semantics. Uh, all right. So, look, I just thought we'd jump into that. So, just you think about that. What are your character's flaws, their weaknesses? Yeah. Um, you know, what, what things make them more than just uh, Captain Amazing? Uh, and that makes more interesting characters. No one really identifies with perfection. Um, that's just not who we are as human beings. And the more you invest your character with real weaknesses, real flaws, whatever you want to call them, the more people can identify. And frankly, the more you'll identify uh, with who you run. So yeah. um, in conclusion, uh, I'm gonna wrap up, but I'm gonna let uh, any of you uh, have the last word. Thank you so much, Evelyn, Terry, and Josh for joining us tonight. Thank you. I really appreciate the time. I think it was a fun topic. I think our viewers mm -hmm. enjoyed it. Yeah, Superman had kryptonite, that's a weakness. Right. Um, so uh, do you have any uh, kind of closing comments? I just it was fun being here tonight and being able to talk about this stuff and 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 understanding that that, you know, how we view things, whether it's Josh, Evelyn, me or you, is going to be slightly different. And understanding that creating a character, regardless of how you do it, helps increase the enjoyment of the game as a whole. Exactly. Well said, Josh. I mean, other than saying ditto, it's it's all about the game. It's as long as everyone's able to leave the game, at least knowing that they're cared for and knowing that everyone at the table is, they leave their problems at the door and they take on the problems together. That's what matters. Communication as a group and communication as a whole, you're there to be a whole and not individual. All right, I'm gonna come back to what you said to, conclu to conclude. Uh, let me go to Evelyn. Unless she says something better, then I'll, I'll conclude with whatever she says. <laughs> I, don't, I mean, I don't really have anything else to add. All right. So, look, I think however you play the game, play it for fun. Play it for the love of the game. Explore it. I've told uh, the LMA crowd many times, but, again, we have a lot of new viewers. Um, and I don't know if Josh and Terry have ever been on. But do you remember the name of the high school role play club that I played in? So this would have been, like, 88, 89. Um, and we had a role play club. Uh, and this is where I got, you know, I was already a D&D &D player for like 10 years, but I played some other stuff like Star Wars and, um, uh, you know, sort of like uh, uh, post-nuclear, I forget what it, Fallout types. It wasn't called Fallout, but whatever it was, uh, James Bond. Uh, do you remember what the name of that club was called? Nerds Anonymous. <laughs> you are so close. So close. You get that. It was called the Escapist Society. And I think somebody mentioned the term escapism earlier in the chat. And yes, this game is about fun. It's about creativity. But ultimately, all art, and I call this art, uh, whether, whether your art is music, whether your art is theater, whether it's writing, many times what that becomes for us is an outlet. And I don't know that we have ever seen a time in human society, well, I guess living in the Black Plague in the 13th century when 90s <laughs> presenters are popular. All right, but I think in recent history, okay, maybe World War II. So, but I think right now, we really need escapism. And so wherever you're at, whatever your circumstance, your situation, your job, your family, your health, um, your struggles, 
use this game and the role play of your characters in this game to be a creative escapist outlet for you and you, my friend, are playing D&D. And with that said, thank you to all of you. Thank you to my, uh, my uh, amazing friends tonight for joining us. Remember, Underdark Uprising, February 19th and 20th. Uh, Tim, who's been on with us, he's kicking us off on day two. Uh, and I think I'm playing in that campaign, although I haven't seen a communication on it in a while, but that's probably me messing up, not him. And thank you to all of our viewers. Thank you to everybody that subbed, everybody that followed. If you're watching and you haven't followed, shame on you. We have one question for you. You should be following us. If you're not following us, what are you doing? What are you doing? Thank you for all the gift subs, <laughs> and everybody have a great night. This is Blue Box signing out. Peace. Thank you, Fraley. Thank you. Thank you.